Florent. Borealis. Paradigm. Expansion. Greetings from the North, citizens of Earth. Welcome. Now, in this day and age of fake news and dis slash misinformation, it is important to have trusted sources within the independent media. Some of the regular channels I keep an eye on, providing me international news, are Stay Free with Russell Brand, System Update with Glenn Greenwald, Redacted with Clayton and Natalie Morris, Tucker Carlson Tonight, Kim Iverson Show, The Duran, and last but not least of my magnificent seven in this field is Jimmy Dore, who I am pleased to announce is our guest tonight. Now, we are deviating somewhat from our normal programming, both in content and format. See, Mr. Dor is coming to Scandinavia as part of his European comedy tour, and I reached out to get him on because I want to help promote it to my compatriots. So unless you are not familiar with him, there's not going to be too much paradigm expansion, although the politically inept will probably get their assumptions challenged by his every second sentence. Indeed, I hope... I do hope many Scandinavians who do not know his comedy or political views are tuning in today and that some of you decide to come visit his stand-up in Oslo, scheduled for April 9th, which I myself will attend. So, this episode today can be considered an advert, a shameless advert, for his Oslo visit, simply for the egotistical reason that It is the only show on his tour not yet sold out, and I do not want him to drop Norway in future tours. And another thing, normally we offer long-form conversations, and I did intend this also for today, picking his brain, hoping to retrieve some new and interesting pieces. For those of you already familiar with Jimmy, but alas, force majeure interfered and we only got to record an hour rather than two as scheduled. The reason being that the electricians working on his house had to cut the power to his studio in the middle of our conversation. And since Mr. Dor is hard to book due to his super busy schedule, as well as the urgency to get this show out in time before his Scandinavia performance, we decided to just run with what we've got. This means there was a bunch of subjects we did not get around to, as my plan was to deep dive in the second hour after getting the basics covered. I especially wanted to discuss further this fake Oslo Freedom Forum, which few Norwegians even know about. And on the more philosophical side, hope to explore Jungian solutions, which Jimmy is also into. Oh well, at least for those who are unfamiliar with my guest, we did get to cover much of his political commentary during our conversation. And here are some clips introducing you to his comedy. Bonsoir! Look at that, I did it. I love being here in Montreal. Everybody is so open-minded, right? doing a show last night, and afterwards this couple came up, and they asked me to sign a CD, and they were real nice. And I was like, hey, what do you guys do for fun around here besides the comedy? And they go, we're swingers. (laughs) I was like, you mean... (laughs) They go, no, we like to have sex with other people. We wanted to know if you wanted to have sex with us. You want me to have sex with both of you? They go, yeah. I was like, ew. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Come on, they bought a CD. I don't want to be a dick. (laughs) And they're nice guys. The point is... (laughs) You never know when the joke is over. (sighs) Oh. 
My brother's a teabagger. <laughs> Not the fun gay kind. <laughs> he likes to vote against his own interest. And uh, my brother hates Barack Obama, calls him an elitist. It's like, that guy's an elitist. He's an elitist. And he is. He's the worst kind. He tried to hide it. First by being born black, sneaky. <laughs> and then when he was two years old, he talked his dad into leaving their family so he could be raised by a single mom, thereby ensuring anything he achieved in his life would come from the sweat of his own brow, the brilliance of his own intellect. I don't like it. <laughs> That's not how it works in America. In America, first your father is president, you're born half a moron, and you become president. <laughs> Call working your way up. My brother hates him. My brother calls Barack Obama Hitler all the time. He goes, that guy's like Hitler. I'm like, you must be watching different documentaries than I am. <laughs> How is he like Hitler? He goes, he's like Hitler because he's trying to take over the health care. <laughs> Just like Hitler. <laughs> oh, you know what? I'm pretty sure universal health insurance wasn't the problem people had with Hitler. <laughs> I think there was a lot of stuff in front of that, Danny. <laughs> <laughs> like people are going, hey, did you hear? Hitler invaded Poland. He's killing all the Jews. <gasps> I hope I can choose my own doctor. <laughs> but the economy is going, it's horrible in America. It's so bad. Like, where all our money go? Because we're supposed to be the richest country in the world. That's what they always tell us. I'm like, well, how can we be broke? Where'd all our money go? So I turn on the news to find out who took all our money. And the news guy told me the teachers took it. I knew it. <laughs> Goddamn money-grubbing teachers. Yep, when I was a little kid, every Sunday, my dad would say, get in the car, gonna take it for a drive through Beverly Hills, show you all the teacher houses. <laughs> the teachers have all our money, yet they're so sneaky, they still drive junky cars just to throw us off. <laughs> oh, there goes another teacher taking a sack of money out to their terse cell. But now, now they're firing teachers by the thousands all across the country, raising class sizes, right? Because that's what's going to get us out of this depression. Dumber kids. <laughs> that's our problem. We're too smart now. How are we going to convince China to open a factory in America if we're all smart enough to know we're being exploited like slaves? <laughs> Funny and sad. <laughs> like, we're laying off teachers. Why are we laying off teachers? They go, we have to save money. Like, well, can't we lay off something else, right? Like, can we lay off this war nobody wants? No, Jimmy, you can't lay off the war. You gotta have the war, and you can't have wars and teachers. <laughs> what are you, an asshole? <laughs> you gotta choose, and we chose the war, which we can't afford the war either. We have to borrow money so we can have a war, and we borrow it from the Chinese, and they give it to us because they're nice people. That's kind of ironic, right? Americans were a bunch of capitalists borrowing money from a bunch of communists so we can bring democracy to a bunch of Muslims who don't even fucking want it. And I come from a dumb family, right? Anybody else? If you come from a dumb family, you know it. Yeah. Yeah. Because normal family, normal people, when someone learns something new, they're like, oh, you learned something new. Teach it to me. I would also like to grow. <laughs> but not in my family. They, if someone knew something they didn't, they got defensive and overreacting. You know, like, here's an example. The most recent thing that happened is uh, one of my brothers started their own company, and we're all sitting around. He goes, you know, I figured out I can make just as much money with five employees as I used to make with six. And I go, hey. That's called the law of diminishing returns, I think. And my dad turns around and he goes, call it whatever you want, it's about making money, stupid. <laughs> and that's my dad, right? As if to say, look at this guy. First he gets a book. <laughs> then he reads it. 
retains that information <laughs> and then shares it at an appropriate moment like an asshole. <laughs> And you know, you're from a dumb family, you just have to accept it. But like, I have a cousin, he's always pretending he's not, you know, dumb and everything. <laughs> like, I caught him one time, we were talking, I forget what about, he goes, yeah, well, I was, I learned that when I was studying for my, my doctorate. I learned that, I, I was like, oh, you have a doctorate? And he was like, uh, no, but I was studying for one. <laughs> you can't just do that. <laughs> You can't just say when I was studying for my doctorate if you never got it and then people think you got it. We're all studying for our doctorate. <laughs> I'm thinking of my dissertation right now. <laughs> you can't say that, what kind of bull. It's like, you know when I was uh, training for the Olympics? Oh, you're in the Olympics? No, but I trained. <laughs> so when I got when I got uh, COVID, it wasn't so bad. I didn't, it was easy for me. It was just like a mild cold, like Dr. Robert Malone said it would be, is Omicron. And, uh, you know, I got it three times because I took Paxlovid, got it again. And, <laughs> and so maybe I didn't get so sick because I got ready for the virus. They never tell you to get ready. They never tell you even can get ready because I guess you can't make money off of vitamin D or zinc or anything like that. So I got my vitamin D up. I got my zinc up. I got ivermectin. Plus, I bought a horse because I don't want to look like an asshole. <laughs> oh, that goddamn Joe Rogan. God damn Joe Rogan, telling everybody about ivermectin and that it works. And then he goes and gets COVID and he beats it in 48 hours. Man, did that piss off the shit libs. <laughs> it doesn't work. But he got better in 48 hours. It doesn't work. He's a jerk. I hate Joe Rogan. Why do you listen to him? I don't listen to him. Okay, that's how you know you don't like him? That is right. <laughs> Isn't that amazing how they did that with uh, that uh, ivermectin? So the weird thing was is that uh, Joe Rogan brought on Dr. Sanjay Gupta on his show, right? <laughs> and I got nervous for Joe Rogan <laughs> because Dr. Sanjay Gupta is a doctor from CNN. And Joe Rogan, he's a pothead comedian who announced this guy's fighting in cages. <laughs> and I was afraid Dr. Sanjay Gupta was gonna humiliate my pal Joe, but I don't know if you watched that episode, the exact opposite happened. <laughs> the pothead comedian ended up schooling the doctor on medical shit for like three hours straight. It was really weird. <laughs> like the first thing that happened was uh, Joe Rogan had to explain natural immunity to uh, Dr. Sanjay Gupta, right? You know, what, you know what natural immunity is? That's when you catch a virus and then your body develops an immune response to it going forward. It's what our bodies have done with viruses since the beginning of fucking time. <laughs> but apparently everybody forgot about that during COVID. But luckily, Joe Rogan is there a pothead comedian to explain it to doctors on television. <laughs> and then the next thing that happened was Joe Rogan got Dr. Sanjay Gupta to admit that they had all been lying about ivermectin. And that ivermectin wasn't horse, horse poison like they were saying it was, that it was actually a human medicine that had been prescribed millions and billions of times it had saved billions of lives, it's a Nobel Prize winning medicine, and it's on the WHO list of essential medicines. And I was like, well then why did they lie and say it was horse paste? And I guess it must be about money, it's about money, it's about money, maybe it's about money, I don't know, it's about money, 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 money. <laughs> and that's why they lied about it. They lied about it because because if ivermectin did treat COVID, they couldn't get their experimental 
uh, use authorization for their vaccine, and then they would lose $100 billion. And so I guess that's a lot of money, that's a lot of money, that's a lot of money. <laughs> And so that's why they made you think it was horse poison instead of a wonder drug, which is what ivermectin is. People thought it could cure cancer before fucking COVID happened, but then the propaganda came in. Isn't that weird? Yes, that's it. And they lied in such an insidious way, they told you half a truth. They said, oh, this is used for horses, which it is, but it's primarily used for humans. You know, uh, antibiotics, 80% of antibiotics are used on farm animals. That doesn't make penicillin a cow medicine. My dog takes Prozac. That doesn't make it a dog medicine. He's just a sad chihuahua. <laughs> What a way, what a way to lie to people, huh? And they all did it. They all said it that way. They all told you just a little bit of the truth. Joe Rogan is taking horse paste. Ivermectin is horse paste. That's like saying, hey, I saw Joe Rogan drinking a glass of water the other day. Why is he drinking toilet fluid? <laughs> Why would Joe Rogan use that stuff that killed all those people on the Titanic? <laughs> you see how in cities, see that? Do you see that's the power of propaganda? Everybody in the country thought that a, a miracle drug, which is what ivermectin was considered before COVID, a miracle drug that could possibly cure cancer, and then they went to be calling it some kind of poison. That's the power of big pharma propaganda. If they could make you think a wonder drug is poison, they can make you think anything. They can, they can make you think the president's not demented. <laughs> But the weird thing that happened around COVID, I'd never noticed this before in any other time in my life, but you weren't allowed to ask questions and at, at any point during this. You just had to, you had to do what the man on the TV said, right? You had to do what the man on the TV said without questions, and then you're a good person. But if you question it, then you're a white supremacist, Trumper, not, they're like, whoa, no, no. <laughs> no, I didn't vote for Trump, I just have questions. <laughs> Jimmy. Only dumb people ask questions. <laughs> no, I'm pretty sure we're supposed to question authority. It's like a value. Uh, is that what they taught you in comedy school? <laughs> yeah, that is what they taught me in comedy school. Isn't that weird? It was the weirdest thing I've ever seen. Even comedians would get on stage and they would shame people for trying to get informed about a medical treatment that was experimental that they had to take or they would lose their jobs and they wouldn't be able to travel. And when people tried to get informed about that, other people shamed them. They would say, please tell me you're not gonna do your own research. <laughs> You've heard people say that, please don't do your own research. You know, before COVID, doing your own research used to be called reading. Now you're shaming me for reading? <laughs> At the behest of Big Pharma? It's like I woke up in the middle of a Bill Hicks bit. Well, looks like we got ourselves a reader. <laughs> Tell me, boy, what you reading for? Don't you know everything that needs to be read has already been readed by a smart person? <laughs> That's how much people internalized the propaganda from Big Pharma was that they would shape, they would be anti-intellectual enough to shame people for reading while they're wagging their finger at them for doing it. You would never shame people for trying to get informed no matter what other subject it was, no matter how unimportant. Like if I say, hey, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go buy a car. Don't look into it. <laughs> well, well, how will I know which car to get? Ask the salesman, he's the expert. What are you, Henry Ford? The two last bits there were from his latest comedy tour called COVID Lies Are Funny. 
for the current European tour, which, by the way, is all stand-up comedy. In other words, no live panel shows, as is another format he tours with in the US. Uh, his performance will also consist of new and current material. Since his genre is observational comedy and political satire, it is an advantage that you are aware of the references he often uses. Even if you are not familiar with him, it helps if you are properly informed and get your uncensored information from independent media rather than tabloid MSM propaganda. And our conversation today will give you a decent introduction. However, as you know, we like to honor our guests with a thorough presentation. So let's first explore the journey he has been on up to date. James Patrick Anthony Dorr is an award-winning stand-up comedian, political commentator and YouTube personality. Hailing from a blue-collar neighborhood in Chicago with 11 siblings and youngest of seven boys, he grew accustomed to playing to an audience early in life and used comedy to get out of trouble. His political awakening was early, and already in high school he argued with his Reagan Democrat father about the presidency. After 12 years at Catholic school, he attended Illinois State University, dropped out after three years and gaining employment as a forklift driver. In these his early years, he also worked as a bricklayer. He later graduated from Columbia College, Chicago, with a degree in marketing communications. After watching many late-night talk shows, he realized he could do better than them and decided to become a comedian. His biggest influence include Jerry Seinfeld, George Carlin and Bill Hicks. Indeed, many describe him as a modern version of Hicks and Carlin. He started performing stand-up in 89 and made several appearances on late-night talk shows early in his career. In 95, he moved to LA where his first break was an appearance on Comedy Central's Make Me Laugh. In 97, he married fellow comedian Stefano Samorano. In 2000, he released his first stand up video called It's Not Brain Surgery. In 04, he was a writer and performer for the off Broadway hit The Marijuana Logs, starring Tommy Chong of Chicken Chong. Also, the same year, he was a lead performer in the Comedy Central special called Comedy Central Presents. In 05, his performances increasingly included political commentary as he moved away from a standard stand-up set to a 50-minute show, which he would later take on tour. He launched the new show Citizen Jimmy at the UCB Theatre in Hollywood, incorporating video clips of politicians, journalists, TV personalities and entertainers. Surprised that no one else was doing it. In 12, this became a monthly show called Left, Right and Ridiculous. In 06, his comedy style was compared by newspapers to Jon Stewart's The Daily Show. 2008 was a busy year for Dorr. He launched the podcast Comedy and Everything Else, which was co-hosted with his wife, lasting to 13. Comedians who were guests included Bill Burr, Lee Camp, Jim Gaffigan, David Spade, Maria Bamford and Kyle Cease. In a 2016 article, Vulture praised an episode as the greatest individual comedy-related podcast episode of all time. Also in 8, Comedy Central aired Doors' hour-long special Citizen Jimmy, based on his UCB show of the same name. The special was chosen best of the year by iTunes and its accompanying DVD was cited as the best comedy DVD of the year by Punchline magazine. The same year, Dor also appeared in the documentary film Super High Me and another stand-up DVD was released called Really? From 09, he appeared regularly on the then innovative online news show The Young Turks and during the 10 years with them, he appeared as a frequent host on current TV's broadcast version called The Young Turks with Shank Uger, as well as the online ver version main show called The Young Turks. In 10, he created his own weekly satirical show called The Jimmy Dore Show, which originated at 
KPFK 90.7 FM in LA and was broadcast uh, nationwide on public radio stations. In 12, this show started running on TYT network via the show The Point with Anna Kasparian. He soon lo- launched his own YouTube channel, which eventually featured near daily videos and weekly live streams. In 14, he authored the bestseller Your Country is Just Not That Into You. In 15, he released a comedy special at Hulu called Sentence to Live. From 17 to 19, he was also hosting his own show on the TYT network called Aggressive Progressives. In 18, he was part of the comedy DVD First Nations Comedy Experience. And in 19, he broke with TYT, where he had been an employee for only one year, otherwise being an independent contractor, leading to his comedic political talk show, The Jimmy Dore Show, becoming entirely independent, streaming every weekday. Per today, it has 1.4 million subscribers on YouTube alone. In 23, he was briefing the UN Security Council, addressing them in a session regarding the proxy war in Ukraine and the U.S. bombing of the Nord Stream 2 project. Politically, he started out as a Democrat and was a Bernie supporter in 16, when he realized that the DNC was hopelessly corrupted, engaged in election rigging and hijacked by corporate interests and neolib ideology. He broke with them and became an independent, which he still is registered as. However, in 21, he joined the Movement for a People's Party, where he remains on its advisory council. Having moved away from the antiquated left-right dichotomy, understanding it remains irrelevant, lest democracy is restored and we are rid of the globalist neocon neolib totalitarianism, which has taken over the Western world. Until then, it's all about top bottom, and consequently he identifies as a populist, joining forces with all stripes of populism, fighting for liberty, autonomy and decentralization, and against war, corruption and corporatism. Dor has performed at many renowned comedy clubs like the Tropicana Comedy Stop, the Palms Playboy Comedy Club, Catch a Rising Star and Harras, as well as at famous comedy festivals including Just for Laughs, the US Comedy Arts Festival, the Melbourne International Comedy Festival and the Amsterdam Comedy Festival. And he has also performed for US troops in Afghanistan. Further, he has made appearances on late night TV shows such as Jimmy Kimmel Live, The Late Late Show with Craig Kilborn and NBC's Late Friday. Although critical of organized religion, he identifies as spiritual and is into Carl Jung, which I intended to discuss with him today, but for the sudden ending. Anyway, let's now hear what we did get around to cover. Welcome to Forum Borales, James Patrick. Pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Now, I'm having you on, not just because I've been following you since, like I said before we started, since your early TYT days. I kind of feel, it's weird, I kind of feel I know you. I guess you get that a lot. Sure. Yeah, but you're coming back to Norway for your comedy tour. So yeah, I'll be in Oslo on uh, April 9th. At the, uh, what is it called? The Ladder? The Ladder Theater? L-A-T-T-E-R? Is that how you pronounce it? I'm not sure. Never heard of it. What kind of obscure back alley thing have you booked? The ladder? I don't know. It's a, it's a 400 seat venue, so I don't know how small. It's, it's not too small. Maybe one of the new ones. I have to look into that. Well, have you played in Norway before? No, but I've been to Norway. I've been to Oslo before for a thing called the Freedom Forum. I know. And okay, let's talk about that run, now. That's run by a bunch of criminals and uh, uh, warmongers who hide behind the patina of of, of helping oppressed people. Uh, it's funny, they only want to help oppressed people in countries that they want to overthrow. And uh, so that's run by a, a criminal named Thor Halverson. I think he comes from Nazi stock back in uh, Venezuela, maybe, or 
Fake uh, Norwegian Argent. name, huh? It's insane. Yeah. So um, also that that chess the champion guy, uh, Gary Kasparov, who's also an unhinged lunatic with Trump derangement syndrome, who's been pushing for war. So the, all these people push for war and they all push for they're pushing for World War Three right now with uh, Russia. And so, yeah, so I was there at the Oslo. Oslo is a very beautiful city. I, I enjoyed the city. Jimmy, Jimmy, I, it's crowned to the second ugliest capital in the world. Oh, uh, I liked it. Maybe I compared thought, to today's America. I don't know the conditions over there. Yeah, no, it was clean. That it, no homeless people. No, and, we don't. That's true. Yeah. But, you know, architecture is havoc. You should really come to the rest of Norway. That's where oh. the, tour the tourists just come to Oslo and then they go to the real tourist destinations. Oh, okay. So, but of course you can't do that because it's not enough market, I guess, for you to, to be. Happy. I just don't have enough. Yeah. I mean, I don't have enough time this time, I'm this fine. trip. I'm going to yeah. seven different countries in nine yeah. days. Yeah. So I'm I'm gonna be hopping around pretty fast. So in fact, Oslo is my last play, the last uh, venue really? I'm playing on this tour. I start off in Stockholm, and then we go to Amsterdam, Rotterdam, Berlin, and then we go to London, and then I think we go to Copenhagen, and then we go to Oslo. I think that's how it goes, and then we go back to. So that's like a Ted. It's gonna we're gonna be uh, on the road for like 10, 11 days straight, which is a lot since I have a new dog. So uh, we're gonna you try. You what now? I have a new puppy. <laughs> okay, what type of dog? Uh, it's a uh, a Patterdale Terrier, but and she's got a little chow in her too, and uh, she's about twenty pounds, or I don't know how much that is in uh, metric, but. Um, Oh, maybe Smart. nine. She's nine, whatever. I, they put her on a scale and it was a metric scale, and it said nine. I don't know what that is. Nine, that nine kilo, I think. Yeah, maybe that. Is that 20 pounds? Anyway. Could be. Could be. Anyway, so, um, so yeah, so I got to get back to her. But I'm looking. All the shows are selling out except for Oslo, strangely enough. So I'm thinking there's a lot of shit libs in Oslo and who are very pro-war because I, I the Norway's turned into like this uh, weapons manufacturing place now and uh, they've been co-opted just like the Peace Prize and all that other stuff just like the Freedom Forum it, it's all a front for uh, the military industrial complex so uh, we'll see but we've got um, I think I've as of today so I don't know today's March 6th or 7th what I say the 7th so I'll be there in a little over a month in Oslo, yeah. and I think I've sold around two hundred tickets at a four hundred seat venue. All the rest of the places. Oh on the shit! Tour. I hope you're not going to cancel. I'm going to do my best to get get the uh -huh. word out. I'm going to uh, drag some friends and go myself. So no, I'm not going to can. No, I'm going to be. I'm coming either way. Okay, uh, cool. I'm coming Great. either. way. So, but um, after this performance, you know, word will uh, spread around. But I'll tell you uh, what the problem is with Norway. If you look at the political landscape, Bernie Sanders is a centrist, okay? Yeah. Centrist. Yes. Uh, of course, both you and me, and we're going to discuss it today, know that the left right dichotomy is as anachronistic as you know, the two cheeks of the same ass, as Galloway say. But yeah. the point is, the political landscape and the political consciousness here is completely different. The problem is the mainstream media is owned by Jeff Bezos. In Norway, he has taken over the entire uh, landscape. And uh, neolibs, people, people believe these neoliberal myths. We're like 10 years behind. So people think Hillary Clinton is a good person. They uh -huh. think... Right, they think Bill Gates wants the best for us. Yeah, they have healthy political instincts, but they have complete polluted information sources. Right, and because of that, and if they go online, they still uh, watch stuff like Sam Cedar or Young Turks. So the shift hasn't reached us yet. We are a little bit behind. But what you've got going for you, I have to say, is the humor. Because Norway has been, ever since the Second World War, we've been close with England. 
not Germany. We used to be close to Germany, then we shifted to England. So we've been like very appreciative of British humor, self-deprecation humor. Yeah, right. Uh, these, you know, Monty Python stuff, uh, Rowan Atkins and stuff like that. So we always got the Anglophone humor. We're not like the Germans who you have to explain the joke to. So uh, I think they will get your humor very well. You know what I mean? Yeah, I hope so. We'll see what happens. Uh, it's it's going to be a, a new experience doing comedy in uh, to people whose English is their second language. So a lot of times when so when I, I had that experience about twenty years ago, I was in um, and I was in Rotterdam, yeah. and I was I did a little stand up and. Um, People didn't, you know, a lot of my comedy is uh, is sarcastic. A lot of my comedy is satirical. And so it's hard for that stuff to translate. So we'll see how yeah, it goes. Plus, they need to know, I think, some of the... It helps if they know you, if they know what you call yeah, them. Yeah, so they'll know me. So now yeah. the people will know me. So I think it'll probably go a lot better. I hope. Uh, but, you know, a small country like Norway... English is like, we, we're much better in general in English than people in Germany and France, because in those countries, they want the world to speak French and German. We have no illusions that people are ever going to speak Norwegian. We, we lost that battle when the Vikings died out. So, so we are, you can hear it on me too, right? Uh, it's a pronunciation that sucks, but we, we understand enough. Yes, to get everything you say. I'm more worried about your references because, like I say, Norwegians have, and the same goes for Swedes and Danes, they don't have very good uh, information sources. We're in a little bubble up here. Okay. That's funny because, you know, being from uh, the United States, I always think that, uh, you know, uh, Europeans and the, the people in the Nordic countries and that, that they're more evolved than we are. And um... and you're right and you're wrong. You're right in that we would never stand for much of the stuff you you uh, which is imposed upon you. So we have like uh, more democracy, more checks and balances, a more fair society. This is why it's so hard to get Norwegians to be critical to the state because the state works. If the state works, it becomes like your mommy and daddy. You understand what I mean? So to yeah. start rebelling against it is very hard. Libertarians are having a very hard time up here. <laughs> oh, okay. I mean, okay. I don't mean social libertarians. I mean like economic libertarians. But right. we're getting there. So, no, it's it's that, you know, in politically, like I say, I think you would appreciate some of the stuff because they haven't dismantled it completely. We still have some of the old school checks and balances. But again, we don't have good information. And that's key. Correct. And that's what we're all stuck in right now, especially you, the information war, uh, the censorship thing. I want to discuss that with you, too. But, Jimmy, can we start with your background? You're from Chicago. Yeah, so I grew up on the southwest side of Chicago in a blue-collar working-class neighborhood. My father was a cop, a Chicago cop, and everybody in my neighborhood was either a cop or a fireman or a garbage man or... It was that kind of a neighborhood. And um, there was a lot of people that were, for, there was a lot of uh, white flight happening. I don't know if people are familiar with that. So in Chicago, they had um, what they call public housing. And right. so they would, they would put, uh, the, the big idea at, at first was to take all the poor people and to put them in the same neighborhood together and build them on top of each other in high rises. And that turns out to be the worst idea. And so then they started doing scatter site, scatter, what's called scattered site housing. And so they would they would put some poor people in each neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And of course they didn't put them in the rich neighborhoods, they put them in the blue collar neighborhoods. And so they built public housing, they built, they called them projects. And so, and then, and I would say 99% of the people who lived in them in my neighborhood were African Americans, they were blacks. So uh, this was a big shock to the culture. 
in my neighborhood and everybody got afraid and so people would sell their house and move they were moving you, to you, the you're from the irish background right yeah but in, every in my neighborhood it was uh irish polish italian all the catholics banded together yeah that's right so mostly catholics and um so they that scared them and so this happened all across chicago and it was called white flight and so uh, the mayor of Chicago then made a rule that if you worked for the city, like my father was a policeman or if you were a fireman, you could not live outside the city boundaries. And the idea was to keep the city tax money that they paid you inside the city, which I think was a good idea. And it stabilized the, a lot of communities because of it. And, it. and it kind of put a slowdown to white flight. It didn't end it. But uh, so that's the kind of, uh, that's what I grew up in, right? And that kind of, and then uh, when I was um, just getting out of high school, going to college, a black guy became the, the mayor of Chicago because two white Irishmen ran against each other. And uh, <laughs> they, they canceled each other out. <laughs> they canceled these, they split the vote. And so then this guy, Harold Washington, came in and boy, did the white people get scared. They thought, oh my God. But it turns out that Harold Washington turned out to be a good administrator and he made sure that the snow got plowed and the garbage got picked up and the grass at the parks got cut and uh, everybody was happy. And there after after uh, you know, after a little while of him being mayor, people who were afraid of him because of his race uh, started to warm up to him and realized that, uh, hey, it didn't matter what race the the mayor is as long as the snow gets plowed and the garbage gets picked up and the grass gets cut. And did that forgot that lesson in 08, huh? Yeah, so they, and so it was, it was, um, it was actually a it was a, it was a big step forward for race relations in Chicago. And then unfortunately he died. Uh, he died while in office. And um, and then we got uh, so so that's the kind of so that's what I grew up and that's how I know that cops are are criminals because uh, I grew up around cops and uh, you know my dad was a cop my grandpa was a cop my oldest brother was a cop my best friends in Chicago were cops that, that's but, why they haven't beaten you to a bloody pile yet huh <laughs> yeah so that's how I I'm, I'm I know I know cops are necessary. And uh, you have to have them, but I also know that um, you've you been know, very outspoken about. They're, they're, if they're not criminals, they're half turning of the screw away from it, yeah. uh, from being criminals. So just like you know, just like the people in the military, they're the terrorists. Yeah. Uh, so the people in the in that who who are drawn to policing are normally bullies or people who were bullied. And uh, they have a chip on their shoulder. So, and then uh, they're, they're... Here, here's an Americana. Sorry to to jump uh, sure. onto your speak, but in Norway, cops still doesn't carry guns. Uh, many cops are women. So here they are like service personnel. If you're a tourist, you can ask them directions. It's it's that kind of. Uh... So yeah, on the side of the police cars in some of the cities in America, it says to serve and protect. Yeah. And um, so I, they, they don't really serve, and they don't really. So they're they're there they're there to protect the property rights of the established of the oligarchy. The but yeah, but but what we just need to know uh, about American cops is that they have been militarized. No, yeah, 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 and that was deliberate. So now, when you see cops patrolling, they look like they're walking around a war zone, right? They're yeah. They're permanently in riot gear. They have some of them have tanks. What yeah. is up with that? There's that's a, that's true, right? So insane. Uh, so the whole the whole country. So there's a saying that you know whatever we do to people overseas, we're going to do to ourselves back at home. And so when we send tanks down the streets out of Iraq and Libya and Afghanistan and and Somalia and Yemen and Syria. Uh, we're going to do it to the United States. We did it and we are doing it to ourselves. We're just, we just test everything out over there. Yeah. And, um, 
And so, I mean, that I, that's the, been a theme of this show is that America is not the world's liberator like they were in World War II. America is the world's terrorists. We're setting the whole Middle East on fire. It's not the Al Qaeda that are the ter are the terrorists. It's the United States. The Either one... way, Al, Al Qaeda is on your pay list. So. And either way, the United States and the CIA are paying Al Qaeda. That's exactly right. And um, so, yeah, so the United States has over 800, probably around 1,000 military bases around the globe. No one else has that. Uh, no other country. Yet we talk. We're right. We're right now occupying a third of Syria, right? Illegally, a third of Syria, which third? The third with the oil. And why are we doing that? And because the president of the United States said we're leaving troops in Syria for the oil. It's our oil and we're taking it. That's a direct quote from the president of the United States. That was from Donald Trump. At least he was honest about our foreign policy and he didn't pretend it was to liberate the people of Syria. It was to steal their oil, which is what our foreign policy for at least 50 years. What we do is we overthrow democratically elected leaders and then we install puppets and then we get all their natural resources to be stolen by western uh, oil companies and fossil fuel companies and just companies in general and so if we can't overthrow them which like in venezuela we to we've actually did it but they got control of their country again so in venezuela we then put these crushing economic sanctions on the people that punish the people so the idea there is you make life such a living hell for the people economically that they'll revolt and overthrow their government and then we can install a puppet. And so that hasn't happened yet in Venezuela. So what has, has happened is 7 million people have left that country as migrants. And now they could, where do they go? They go to the United States and in the United States, Joe Biden has an open border policy. So anybody who fleeing here gets to come in. They don't have any way to track them. And then they go to these cities that are called sanctuary cities and they give them credit cards, debit cards, so they can go spend it and buy food and shelter and clothing. And we don't do that for American citizens, but we do that for migrants, which we have no paperwork on, no way to to uh, that we turned into desperate enough people to leave their own countries. So I don't blame the migrants. I blame uh, the establishment and their system of open borders and economically sanctioning poor countries so we could overthrow their governments and steal their natural resources. That's been the United States foreign policy for my whole lifetime. Here in Europe, the, uh, there's not the open borders. Sweden is probably the most open and uh, the unions are still powerful here. We don't have the mafia running the unions, right? We have workers running the unions, so they they kind of work, right? And they ne would never stand for something like that. It's been the policy of the left to the traditional left because it's the corporists' dream to flood a country with unemployed people so that salaries and wages go down. So that's correct. But they, they turn it around and make it look like racism. That's right. <laughs> that's exactly right. And right? so... So yeah. that's the problem. So people here, they don't transfer that lesson to America. So they, most people think Donald Trump is like a, is like a crypto-Nazi. And they think this Clinton Foundation is, is such a great thing. And they think Joe Biden is like a, a cozy old grandfather. That's the problem. Now, of course, more and more, especially the young, are getting information from uh, the unrigged media, meaning, uh, uh, for example, your show uh, and mine, for that, that matter. And that's why they have to smack down uh, free speech. Now, in America, you have the First Amendment. In Britain, they, as you know, they have no such thing. If they want, they can just... And they have done it, banned free speech overnight. Yeah. Here in Norway, we actually have something akin to the First Amendment. We have free speech protected. But even though some countries have uh, in law that they should accept free speech, how would you assess the current situation? I can tell you in the United States... We have censorship by social media. So if you if you look at places like YouTube and Facebook as the town square, you know, 80 percent 
of Americans get their news from Facebook or Google, right? So because Google yeah. controls all the algorithms. So that's not that's not healthy for a democracy when people have centralized percent. Uh, that's like that gives them centralized power to control the narrative. And I had a gentleman, uh, a professor on my show that shows that Google is uh, intentionally rigging. Just uh, had him on, Dr. Robert Epstein. I had him on myself. Great yeah. guy. Very so important they, work. Go on. So so you you have the you have the veneer of freedom of speech and free thought. What you actually yeah. have is. Uh, the most propagandized people in the world is the United States. And they're, you know, as, as immediately during COVID, uh, they started censoring. They didn't, uh, censor should start, started with a guy named Alec Jones. And Al, everybody was, nobody complained too loud because they had the media, the establishment media had built Alex Jones out to be some kind of a maniac. And uh, turns out he wasn't. He's not. He's just he's actually right about a lot of things and he's flamboyant, which is different than being a maniac. He's hyperbolic. That's his crime. He, yeah, he, he, he's bark, he barks too loud in the face of the elites. Right. So the so I was the only one who I was the canary in the coal mine or Alex Jones was actually. And I pointed it out. And at the Young Turks, even they fought. They were all for censoring Alex Jones. I and I, and I'm like, well, you know, you guys run an independent news organization, and you know, the next time you go against a war or you go against the establishment, they're going to censor you. Well, lucky for the Young Turks, they don't ever go against wars, and they don't ever, <laughs> yeah. they, they don't ever go against the establishment. Right. They are the establishment, so it doesn't matter. That's why they were for censorship, and that's why they're pro censorship. And they got half the country. To, in the, at least half the country in America is for censorship. And the reason why, even though we're supposed to be built on freedom of speech and the First Amendment, which is about freedom of speech and religion, what they what, the reason why is that they've been convinced that we need to, we're fighting Hitler and we're fighting Nazis and we're fighting fascism. When in fact we're funding Nazis in Ukraine right now, we're in bed with fascists. We are the fascists. If you're censoring, every dictator says they they're censoring to fight uh, a a brutal outsider who wants to lie to you. That's exactly what they're doing now. But the, the lies they say are coming from misinformation inside our own country. So they have to protect people from misinformation. Well, you know, I don't need to be. I don't need the government to protect me from misinformation because I know the government is the number one liar in the world, and second to the government is the corporate media, and third, and a distant third, are random people on social media. So I don't have to worry about random people on social media because when it started out with this, the censorship was just going to be Alex Jones. It's just going to be this one maniac. And the next thing, and then it went to scientists and then it went to journalists. Then it went to the leading doctors and the former president of the United States yeah. Yeah. got kicked. Yeah. So it's anybody who the establishment doesn't like and they're, you're going to be censored. And you were, you were censored. And again, you're not censored for lying. You're censored for telling the truth. Look what's happening to Julian Assange right now. He's not in prison in Belmarsh for lying. He's in prison because he revealed the war crimes of the establishment. And that's what they can have. He revealed that Barack Obama worked for the exact same people George Bush did, which is Wall Street and the military industrial complex by releasing an email that came from Citigroup to Barack Obama's campaign with a list of people they wanted in Barack Obama's cabinet. And every one of those people on that list ended up in Barack Obama's cabinet. Which with, is one why ex with one exception, I think. Yeah. Yeah. which is why Barack Obama didn't prosecute any of the people who did yeah. the Iraq war and ordered a worldwide torture program, which Barack Obama is constitutionally required to prosecute those people, but he didn't. And the public reason he gave was because all those torture crimes happened in the past and Barack Obama was looking towards the future. I'm glad all the people in prison, <laughs> I guess they're in prison because they committed crimes in the future. Anyway, so the real reason he didn't prosecute those people is because he works for the same people that George Bush and Dick Cheney did, yeah. and that is the military industrial complex, and that is Wall Street. And the fact that they gave Barack Obama a Nobel Peace Prize just goes to show you that the Nobel Prize is completely corrupted. Let it's me explain that. Yes. Uh, it's so embarrassing. You see, the Nobel Committee up until that, that point had pretty decent people on board. 
the problem is uh, the the parliament choose uh, the committee and in the parliament you know stoltenberg the maniac who runs nato right now yeah yeah he's a fo- former prime minister and he was conniving and conspiring his way to the top of the then the ruling party and the guy he pushed away become the head of the Nobel Nobel committee. So they are from the same party and they are not Eve stooges. It's actually not the conspiracy or corruption in that case. They are just naive idiots. And they were so tired of Bush. They were so tired of like, and they still have this view of America that America is very, uh, uninformed people, very ignorant people, very unrefined people, which of course it's true, but the problem is they don't know what's actually going on in America. They don't know the new rise, the new political landscape. They still think in left, right dichotomy. So they felt that they felt like many Americans did for the Obama thing. They hadn't learned the lesson from Chicago that race doesn't matter. So they thought it's a black guy. This has to be great. And so, (laughs) yeah, right. So now we want to give a signal to the world that we are against wars, that now it will be peace. Now it will be brotherhood. Now angels will descend from the sky playing harps. So we're giving the Nobel Prize to this guy before he even did anything. And then, of course, he proceeded to do a lot of wars. So that's kind of the background for why, uh, you know, these these people gave it to him. But today, the Nobel Committee has been exchanged with uh, partisan politicians, so it's it's no use anymore. But tell me one thing: when it comes to free speech, yes, how on earth have you managed to keep your channel floating on YouTube still? I really don't know. They did come for me during COVID and they gave me bogus strikes on my channel. Uh, I was the first one to catch on that the vaccine actually didn't stop transmission or contraction of the virus. And uh, so I was pointing out how the countries around the world that had the largest vaccine uptake were also having the largest outbreaks of the virus of COVID. And, uh, and I, and I, caught on to that and i i was telling people that you you can't vaccinate your way out of a virus like this this isn't how it works you can never so that's what same reason you can't vaccinate yourself out of a cold um so when i reported that they uh, came at me and took five of my videos down and gave me what they call a community guideline strike so if i did that again i would be in big trouble uh, when I pointed out to them that the FDA, even on the, which is the Food and Drug Administration, the official government agency in the United States that handles that stuff, said they didn't know that the vaccine uh, stopped transmission. They hope it did. Uh, <laughs> yeah. They 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 then said I had to I, I had to give more context. Uh, so they just kept moving the goalposts, and so. They were given so now we we've learned through the Twitter files and the Matt Taibbi's reporting that uh, the government, the FBI, Big Pharma, White House, were sending messages to Twitter and to social media. I'm sure it's same thing with YouTube and Facebook, and they were telling them who to censor and what who to shut up, and you got to hit this guy, and so. They were, I'm sure they were given an order that you have to, we want to see action taken on Jimmy Dore. And so they did. Yeah. And that was. And, that. and you had some smear pieces on you too in the mainstream. Oh, yeah. They've been, they've been running smear pieces on me ever since I started telling the truth about Russiagate, that that was an FBI and a Kalin Clank campaign hoax, that Russiagate was co- the dumbest conspiracy theory of my lifetime that half the country buys hook, line, and sinker. Yeah. Um, um, and I all and I told the, the Young Turks when I was at the Young Turks and they would repeat the CIA and FBI talking points about Russiagate, that that's exactly what they were doing and that they're going to use this to start a war someday. And they did. Of course, they used it to the Ukraine war. So if they demonized Putin 
Putin and Russia, they could use that for war. And that's exactly what they did. So I was right about that, too. So if you're right about war and you tell the truth about it, if you're right about big pharma and you tell the truth about it, uh, they will write smear pieces about you in the magazines and in the newspapers. And that's exactly what happened. I was also right about Seth Rich. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you know who that is, oh, but they were amazing case, huh? They put me in a smear piece in Washington. It's a guy named Dave Weigel, who's a liar for the administ for the oligarchy. He's uh, handpicked by Jeff Bezos to cover progressive politics. And why would you pick a guy like Dave Weigel for the Washington Post to cover progressive politics? Because he's a pro-war maniac. Neocorn. He's a neocon. When he was in college, he did pro-war rallies. And of course, that's the guy that Jeff Bezos is going to pick to cover progressive politics. Jeff Bezos, folks, is the same guy who owns Shipstead, who owns 60 percent of the media landscape in Norway. So Jim is talking about the the oligarch, the, the billionaire who actually runs our news media. And of yeah. course, most of America. I didn't know that. I didn't know. I thought he only owned the Washington Post in the United States. Oh, no, no. Was... That's why Norwegians are deluded because of Jeff Bezos. And, and we don't even know it. We don't even know he's the one who owns our media. Yeah. Because they kept the Norwegian names of these companies. You know how it works in corporatism today. There's a, door, a mother company and that, that has a mother company and that has a mother company. Right. right. All of our files are free and will remain free. If you like the show, you can show support by donating $1 to help with expenses. Just use the paid link on our webpage. Thanks. That reminds me, Jimmy. Uh, you know, the, the dichotomy is dead, and you often have own people who used to identify as the right. I have a, a humble suggestion for you because I, I can see how uh, left and right is coming together, but some of the language is keeping us apart. I suggest, and, and you know, it's just a suggestion, do exactly as you want. But when you try to explain to the so-called right-wingers who are populists, who are on our side, who are fighting up, that we are suffering under corporatism, I hear you sometimes call it capitalism. And they instinctively react against that because in their book, what's going on now isn't capitalism. And straightly speaking, it's not. It's neither socialism nor capitalism. You know, the people on the right call it socialism and the people on the left call it capitalism. I think we both need to start calling it corporatism because that's what it is. It's kind of... Yeah. And you've said this in your show yourself, I think, that if you marry... What happens if you marry corporation and state? That is fascism, right? That's, that's a, well, that that's what Mussolini said it was. So yeah. I think that's the definition of any. So when the corporate, when the when the government, the state stops acting in the interests of its citizens and voters and starts acting in the interests of its corporations, that's fascism. So that's what that's we have. That's what we have today. Yes, and, 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 you, and you don't know this, but Norway, uh, you know, we used to be social, we're still social democratic. And we used to, half the people used to be on the side of Soviet Union <laughs> back in the uh, Cold War. We were sympathizing with them. We were always instinctively skeptical to America. Now, today, there is more capitalism in Norway than in America. So many people here have small businesses middle businesses you can actually make a living here and kind of succeed because although we do have corporatism and it's getting worse and worse we still have protections we have labor protections and we have small business protections compared to to america whereas in america it's so goddamn rigged are you aware of um, james corbett yes yeah, they got rid of him too. Him. One of the early ones. Yeah. He's he a truth teller about a lot of things. Yeah, he had a great documentary about how the stock market is utterly rigged. 
There's no such thing as capitalism anymore going on in America. So I avoid, I've stopped using that name and it's so much easier to get people who actually are not socialists, but, you know, are old school conservatives or populist right. So easier to get them on board to fight uh, the man. When I stopped saying capitalism, man, I, I just address it as corporatism and it's rigged. Nobody wants it rigged, not even capitalists. You understand my point? Yeah, I got it. So, no, 100%. So uh, I think, uh, you know, I'm not, an, I'm not a scholar, right? So I was a C student. I was just a comedian. And I started doing a YouTube show. But what I do know, I'm pretty sure Marx predicted all of this. He yeah. predicted that at the in the end, uh, at the end stage of capitalism, capitalism turns into fascism and fascism turns into, I mean, and capitalism turns into monopolies. And that's exactly what we have in the United States. We used to have 50 giant media companies up until 1996 when Bill Clinton consolidated the media in the United States, which that's healthy. The more media companies you have, the better you have more voices. Yeah. Now we're down to six and it's only it's 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 owned by about 15 different billionaires, one of them, Jeff Bezos. And so that's why we don't and Americans still think that they don't that they're getting the news when they turn on the TV news, when they read the New York Times and the Washington Post, they think they're getting the news. What they're getting is what what Noam Chomsky called manufacturing consent. That's what the news is here to do in the United States. It's there to manufacture consent for the establishment. And that's, and that's CNN, MSNBC, Fox News. So if you're a right-wing news outlet, left-wing news outlet, center news outlet, they are all doing the same thing. They all tell the same story when it came to Ukraine, when it came to Gaza, when it comes to Iraq. They all tell the same story, Afghanistan, the same pro-war narrative you can hear on every. So that's the big thing. And that's what you, you can't tell the truth about war. And if you do tell the truth about war, you're immediately slandered as a Putin no, puppet. Not just war. It, it seems that they have a, a paradigm, an overtone window that is so goddamn tight that uh, they want us to believe that, you know, the world is 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 bleak. There's no hope. We are just rats yeah. in a maze. We are machines. They don't want us to know about UFOs. They don't want to know about uh, pedophile islands for the elites. They don't want to know want us to know about stuff like 9/11, JFK, the Vax. It goes far beyond wars. It's all the interests of the corporations yeah. are on board. And isn't it weird, Jimmy, that since you started out as a public uh, broadcaster, not just a comedian, but also in your in that time. Haven't you seen the real overtone window shift from... Because I can remember back when I started in 15, you could not talk about UFOs. You were a maniac. You could not talk about 9-11. You were like... It was like flat earth level conspiracy. You could certainly not talk about pedophile islands or that vaccines are damaging. You could hardly talk about JFK. And today... All these issues have become like mainstream among the independent press. It's like you it's your grandmother who doesn't believe these things now. <laughs> so, uh, so I see a shift uh, going on towards, should I say, uh, uh, an awakening across the board about all the uh, rigged things in our, you know, in our world today. On all levels, not just the war level, not just the political level. Well, I mean, look what happened to the truckers. It was a completely yeah. peaceful protest in Canada. They yeah. were protesting vaccine mandates and authoritarianism and forced medical. You, you know, we were used as guinea pigs during COVID. There was no long-term studies on this. And now we're finding out how dangerous it is and all the vaccine side effects. That's supposed to take 10 years in trials because you don't know what the effects are going to be. We still don't know what the effects are going to be from these COVID-19 vaccines. We won't know for another seven, eight years. And the, what we do know so far is is horrible. 
And so the, the truckers in Canada were the only ones to stand up against that. And they were immediately demonized by the establishment as racist, as violent, and as uh, white supremacists and Nazis. And of course, and most all of that... them were Hindus. <laughs> yeah, right. And of course, that was completely made up. And uh, so now if you can, they can call you a terrorist, they can freeze your bank account and uh, they can control you that way. That's why digital currency is the devil. And so we should resist digital currency at all costs. Uh, central banking digital currencies, CBDCs. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, look what they that's exactly what they did to. Yeah, I mean. We live in a total, it's a pretty close to a totalitarian society. You're not really allowed in, in, in any way to oppose the establishment. And if you do, they just deem you a terrorist or uh, and and they can shut you, kick you off of social media. They can freeze your bank account. They can make you a non-person, as they said in uh, George Orwell's 1984. And so we're living in George Orwell's 1984 right now. The problem is, the people identify with the establishment. They don't identify with the people fighting the establishment. It's at least in the United States. Again, they see the truckers as the bad guys. They see the government as the good guys. Imagine that lefties who see the government <laughs> as the good guys. It's the crazy. They're not lefties. I have to explain that to people. The Democrats yeah. aren't lefties. If you're for forced medical treatments on people, you're not a lefty. If you're for war, you're not a lefty. OK, so it, they are neo neoliberals. That's what we need to at, call at them. best. They're neoliberals. I call I, I say they're just authoritarian neocons, but neoliberals. Yeah. Marx, Marx was right, but he should have predicted also that uh, socialism obviously leads to fascism, too. Uh, you've you've seen this um, development you like you know stalin took over so it seems to me that yeah. authoritarianism is what's taking yeah. over as soon as people you know I, i'm an old anarchist so i well, think the, you know there's a there's a quote from one of the founding fathers of america i think it was benjamin franklin maybe not maybe somebody else but anyway the quote is the price of liberty is eternal for uh, the price of liberty is eternal vigilance Right. So that yeah, any system will turn into fascistic system. There's always people who want to control. There's all there's always going to be the 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 drift towards monopolies and authoritarianism, and you have to resist that no matter what system you're in. Yeah, yeah, and that's why uh, we need uh, populism. We need people to be uh, engaged, not just in voting, but in all sorts of checks and balances. And one of the uh, interesting things in America is that you have a re, uh, reawakening when it comes to unions. The old unions are super corrupt. Yes. But uh, I've been following your reporting. Uh, like I said to you before we went on, you have class consciousness, as they call it. You are always on the money when it comes to uh, realizing what serves the elites and, you know, warning against neighbor being put up against neighbor and you've been just to, if people you know i can't expect everyone to follow your shows religiously but you've been reporting very good on things happening in the world of the unions you've been supporting the teacher unions when they were striking you were supporting christian smalls or whatever it was called uh and and you know so you've been with the little man since day one. And that's the instinct I think you also used when it came to COVID. You realized, because for some reason it became a left issue to applaud the Bill Gates uh, uh, policy. And it became a right issue to protect your uh, bodily autonomy, which used to be a left <laughs> value. Right. <laughs> But you were on the money there too when nobody else was. And so many people look to you for support in that period because in the beginning it was very, very, I don't even want to use the word dangerous, but it was very hard to say something. It was like this tsunami. It reminded me of right after 9-11. Yes, I yes, I, people were afraid, and when people get afraid, that that uh, presses on their fear button, and so all exactly. rational thinking goes out the window, window, and they beg for authoritarian 
uh, solutions to their problems. They want a daddy. They want to come and, and protect them. So um, what happened during COVID was all the people who were supposed to stand up against it and uh, didn't. And it was it fell on the shoulders of comedians like Russell Brand, Joe Rogan and me. Yeah. And I've known people I've known all my life, 30 years in the business, uh, turned on me and smeared me on social media without a conversation. Uh, with big that that's then that's the power of fear. And of course, none of them are going to apologize for it. So I was not only smeared, in, you know, in national publications and the newspapers and the magazines and the news shows. Uh, I was smeared by people who've known me my entire life as if I had my character had had somehow changed overnight. But but what actually changed was theirs. And uh, they gave in to propaganda and they gave in to fear. Hey, I gave in to the fear of, of COVID initially also. What woke me up to it was when I got my vaccine and I was vaccine injured. And then I started to look into everything COVID. And I found out, turns out they were lying about everything. They were lying about <laughs> everything. The Everything. They were lying about the origin of the virus. They were lying about funding the creation of the virus, the scientific re They were lying about uh, masks. They were lying about herd immunity. They were lying about natural immunity. They were lying about the vaccine trial data. They were lying about pre transmission. They were lying Lockdowns. about Lockdowns. They were lying about lockdowns. They were lying about vaccine side effects. They were lying about the six feet of distance theory. Yeah. That was just completely made up. There wasn't a thing they didn't lie about, and they're still lying about it until this day. And the death numbers. And the death of great, of course. If you got in a car accident and went to the hospital and died, they said you died of COVID. If you got shot by a gun and you had COVID, they said you died of COVID. So that was the I, I game. Over Mactin, they lied about over Mactin. You, you've been on the money on that. They lied one. about uh, alternative treatments. They lied about hydroxychloroquine. They lied about ivermectin. They also uh, lied about monoclonals, right? They they limited those. They wouldn't. The states that wanted to give those to the people, monoclonals, which actually treats COVID, we know it. Uh, and actually treats vaccine injury, they, they restricted the release of them because the federal government controls that. They passed laws in California that criminalize doctors from practicing medicine. And just the way doctors normally practice medicine, they tried to criminalize, had to get returned, uh, it had to get overturned by a court. But that's, to, so the people who are screaming fascism at the top of their lungs are the people who are the fascists. And that would be the Democratic Party, the Republican Party, and the establishment. And the news media. Jungian projection, huh? That's exactly, that's classic <laughs> Jungian projection. But uh, uh, what I can't figure out, because uh, this is obviously the very powerful interest who earned a lot of money here. And uh, we know that the American health system is in the pocket of Big Pharma. It's a subsidiary of Big Pharma. But if you look to Scandinavia, you will see that Iceland, Finland, Sweden, Denmark, and Norway all have uh, what you guys call Medicare for All. And we have some autonomy in our system. Yeah. Nevertheless, we went on board with this craziness. I think partly because we're looking to WHO, because we still think that's some kind of noble uh, UN thing. But it's interesting also to see, I, I think it's also CAA who were leaning on our officials because there seems to be scattered protests. I'll explain to you. It's very interesting. Uh, nobody has talked about this, but I've noticed a pattern. All the Scandinavian countries were following along except on one area, and they choose one area each to dissent. For example, Sweden, as it's very famous in, in the world, never locked down. And they were slaughtered for that in the beginning. Of course, now they're vindicated, but they booted the guy who, who took the decision but before they waited to see the results when all the pressure came on. But they didn't look down. Yes. Iceland always shared the science in real time. It's thanks to Iceland and Israel that we could, that people like you could be on the money from day one and say the truth about what was going on because you had some access to, to real data. That's thanks to Iceland. Norway was the first to look up and 
increased the pressure. So, uh, Boris Johnson had to lock up and suddenly everybody had to lock up. Denmark were the first to publish VAX damage uh, studies. So it seems that they were following along on all areas, but they choose one area each to kind of uh, go against the grain. Instead of, you know, why why didn't they do it, all of them, at the same areas? So I, I kind of see that it's like some kind of timid attempt to dissent from the... Uh, I should just call it CIA pressure because that's where it's all coming from. We know now that COVID was a, a Pentagon thing or a DARPA thing. Yeah. yeah. So, yes, uh, Anthony Fauci, after 9-11, was appointed the head of DARPA, which is uh, the Pentagon, basically the military in the United States. And he was appointed the head of their bioweapons program. And so, for for instance, uh, Barack Obama put a pause on gain of function research uh, because they kept the the viruses that they were applying gain of function to kept leaking from their research facilities in the United States. And so, what Anthony Fauci did because the Pentagon wanted him to was um, he then uh, started doing that gain of function research in China at the Wuhan lab against Barack Obama's wishes and he started he need, he did it in a sneaky way he funded it through a CIA cutout organization called Echo Health Alliance so instead of uh Anthony Fauci directly giving that money to the Wuhan lab he gave it to a group called the Echo Health Alliance then the Echo Health Alliance which was a CIA cutout gave it to Wuhan lab so Anthony Fauci is doing the bidding of the military industrial complex and the CIA. He's not working for the president. He's not working for the Congress. He's not working for the American people. He's working for the CIA, the military industrial complex, and a handful of billionaires that run the world. Yeah. Uh, I, I, my only hope is uh, that Robert F. Kennedy can... Uh, I know he's bad on, on, on Israel, but look at the options, man. At least he has the know-how. Trump has the will to take down these people, but he does not have the competence. And also, I don't trust his balls. I think he's timid when pressure really hits. Well, he certainly collapsed when it came to Julian Assange, yeah. when it came to Edward Snowden. He, he collapsed like a like a pancake, and um, he didn't stand up. But that... and. Uh, I mean, you can kind of understand they threatened to uh, in, to convict him uh, if he did, if he uh, and they would have. Right. Look what they're yeah. doing to him now. So they're they're weaponizing the justice system in the United States, just like they did in uh, Pakistan, just like they did in Brazil. They're doing it in the United States. And so that's the new game. They criminalize their political opponents. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you don't have to be a fan of Donald Trump to realize that that's what they're doing. I'm not a fan of Donald Trump, but I do realize that's what they're doing. Absolutely. And if they're doing it to Donald Trump, they'll do it to anybody, anybody who gets outside. And, and why is it? It's because the donor class hates Donald Trump. That's the real elite, right? So the elite billionaires that actually run things with all the money. And they control the politicians. They control Joe Biden. They control Joe Biden's not making any decisions about Ukraine or Gaza. It's being decided for him and he's given an order. And that's a fact. And if you don't think that you're just you're naive in the extreme. So those are the people who actually run things. Uh, we don't live in a democracy in the United States. We live in an oligarchy that was proven by a study from Princeton over 10 years ago that uh, public policy and laws are never written with the input or to reflect the will of the voting class. It's always there to reflect the will of the billionaire class. So yeah. uh, this idea that you have to vote for a Democrat to save democracy is a joke because we haven't had democracy in our country for at least a couple of decades, probably more. That's right. Uh, when you say Assange, that's when I realized something is rotten in the state of not just Denmark, but the whole world. Because if you recall, what happened to him overnight was that PayPal, yes. all the banks, uh, you know, I, I don't remember all of them, but it was like all these multinational corporations at the same time came out. Yes, And that is the definition of conspiracy. 
It's no coincidence. So if they are talking on the talk back in, when was it, 2010, 2012, that early? Then what happened to uh, Corbett and Jones later was just a repeat of that same thing. And That's you right. you also mentioned CB, what's it called again? CBCD? C, yeah, the Central Banking Digital Currency. Yeah. So I'm so happy that you are uh, awake to, because not many people on the left are, are awake to Bitcoins which I myself has uh, woken up to. It's our only, it's our best bet. You should have more shows about that. It's a long time since I've seen you report on that. But you realize that Bitcoins isn't just a way for us to keep control of our own money. It's a way to starve uh, authoritarianism. The state itself becomes undermined. Because this, uh, the the state uh, has the advantage today that they control the money, they issue the money. Right. So, and that's why you see the establishment right now demonizing Bitcoin, saying yes. it's the it's the currency of terrorists. And uh, so that's that's the game now is to try to. I bet that there's going to be a push to outlaw Bitcoin in the United States by saying that it's being used by terrorists. And um, and it's just because it threatens the system that uh, it controls the world. And so uh, I just actually did do a uh, I did a segment on Bitcoin yesterday on my show. The video will be released probably uh, later today. Who or was tomorrow. it with? Say it again. Uh, who was the guest? Uh, the guest was a guy named Paul Stone, who. Uh, He's actually a guy helping me invest my uh, re retirement money. So he's he uh, runs a precious metals company, and uh, I met him through a mutual friend. The gold people are usually not that positive to uh, Bitcoin, but that's just because of competition. But he was honest and, and said it was a good thing. Uh, yeah, they, they, the, the ones that I've talked to, I've talked to people besides him, but he was the guest for that. But um, I've talked to people like uh, Max Kaiser, obviously, yeah, he's good. Bitcoin enthusiast. And I talked to people like Ed Dowd. And uh, so there's uh, I've talked to other people and they're uh, Bitcoin enthusiasts. And it just, you know, there's a the, the thing that Paul Stone was saying. He said, yeah, you know, exactly what I said is that once it becomes a big enough threat to the government that they can get rid of it, right? He goes, they can't get his, his hedges. They can't get rid of gold. Gold is forever, Yeah, but they can, you know, you have to, you have to have an internet hookup. You have to have a phone line. You have to have something like that to get at your uh, Bitcoin money. And uh, if, if the government can control that, which they can, uh, they can control your access to your money and all that stuff. So that was that's his point. I get that. But he also says that, you know, you don't, you don't want to be left out. Nobody wants to be left out on this thing called Bitcoin because uh, it seems like it's just going to keep going, which I think it will. So I um, once the so banks are starting to buy Bitcoin. And so Wall Street is starting to buy it. Yeah. So I think that makes it a those those are the people who actually run things. So if they have a big enough interest in it, maybe they it won't. So I, I think it's a good bet. I think it's a safe bet. The Bitcoin. But I'll tell you, I'll, I'll blow your mind here, because uh, what really uh, is the baseline that says because all these people you're talking about now, they could go out of Bitcoin overnight if they wanted to short it or something. Um, right. But it would still survive because they try, They have outlawed it. They arrested a guy, by the way. Uh, what was his name? Uh, Ross. Free Ross. We have a show coming up about that. They punished him. They blamed him for Bitcoin. He had this uh, Silk Road or whatever it was called. Uh -huh. So they tried to... They try, Yeah, he's one of these uh, uh, martyrs like uh, Snowden and, and Assange, but he doesn't get any attention. But they, they try to outlaw it. They try to uh, manipulate it. You know, every time they come in the press and say, oh, Bitcoin has fallen. Oh, everybody flee. Nothing happens with Bitcoin. That's it's two reasons. Number one, or everyone who has bitcoins, <laughs> they know what why they have it. So it's not enough to scare them. But here's the second thing that will blow your mind, and which is, I think, is a sign of the future. I've been traveling the world. If you go to uh, countries like India 
or, or West Africa, you'll notice that it's very poor countries and they have corrupt leaders. And although they have a lot of uh, resources, it, it doesn't drip down to the poor people. So what the people do is that they've created an alternative economy. They started to do that. Right. And what they're using is Bitcoin because all the people in poor countries are mobile phones. So if I go to a market there, they they pay from one, uh, you know, I buy a banana, whatever. The buyer buys with Bitcoin. Of course, that guy doesn't have like you and me who saves in Bitcoin. We put in like thousands of dollars in Bitcoin. They uses it. So they uh, maybe I just have $10 in Bitcoin, but I use it all the time. So it's being used as a living economy. The state has no control. The dictators cannot interfere. I don't buy that argument that, uh, you know, they have control over your phone. Therefore, yeah, well, there are ways around that, too. So you can encrypt it. You can uh, have a VPN. There are ways around it. And they cannot sit and monitor every single person's phone and try to. So this is what I think will save Bitcoin. And that's why I think it's a very safe bet for people to. Yeah. You know, you can invest in gold. You have money enough now to do that but most people can't but they can invest in bitcoin that's why bitcoin will survive this thing you know apart from all the other reasons which your guests have right said. yeah right hang on what hey um listen it's i i have a guy here mm -hmm. uh, my ele my electrician we're having electrical problems so he has to turn off the electricity wow. to this studio right now and so i'm gonna lose power so let me i have to say goodbye right now and wrap it up okay but let's uh yeah okay okay if you would right. indulge me thank you so much al it's my pleasure thanks for having me on and um i'll see everybody in oslo on april 9th absolutely go, go to jimmydoor.com for a link for tickets go and watch thank you so much jimmy okay, okay. take care pal bye-bye bye, -bye. Bye. Bye. And thanks again to Jimmy for graciously visiting our show. You know, this is one of the uh, things that makes him stand out among others who has reached the size of his show is that he is not below visiting smaller shows like mine. Indeed, he often gives um, gives his time to, to smaller shows, helping them that way. And uh, yeah, is anything but the prima donna. I, I guess working, uh, you know, having a working class background makes him cognizant, you know, immune, immunizes him of becoming too much of a snob. So that, th this is a very sympathetic trait uh, that is true for him. But I, I feel I, I want to add something, you know, in lieu of uh, having the chance to, to get deeper into things with him. I want, just want to add some of my own observations. And it's so unfair. You know, of course, he's being smeared. Of course, he's being attacked by everyone in the establishment and their stooges. So that's a given. So, so nobody is, is shocked about that. But there is one thing that soothsayers like... Jimmy Dore suffers from that is kind of invisible, and that is the being right syndrome. If you are right and someone else is wrong, as someone else is wrong, then it's so common. <laughs> like Jimmy says himself, they will forgive you for being wrong, but they will never forgive you for being right. And so when he is so, I don't know what it is with his incredibly political instinct, but he has a track record of being right about all the major issues of the day. But this, this you don't know while it's going on. You can only know it in retrospective. So he is very early out and then he gets beaten up for that. And when he is eventually proven right, everyone who then has carried resentment against him for this thing, resentment is an emotion and that poison is still with them. So quietly they may record, if they even recognize it, uh, but never an apology, never a settlement, just quietly going on without giving any attention to it. So, so th this, this is costly. For, I'll give you some example. He was very early out 
revealing that Bernie had sold out. And, oh, you know, his supporters, that cost them a lot, many of them, because they were so married to the idea, to the hope, right? So they started hating on Jimmy instead. You know, it's like Jimmy says, we're a nation of adult children of alcoholics. We don't get mad at the people who are inflicting the pain in this country. We get mad at the people calling it out. And that is Jimmy's fate. Another thing was Russiagate, one of the first to blow the whistle on that, because Jimmy never suffered from the Trump derangement syndrome. Neither did he have the version of it which thinks Trump is the second coming of Christ and can no, do no wrong, nor the version that he is the devil incarnate and you have to be in opposition to everything he says and does. So when Russiagate was launched to distract from the humiliating 16 loss of Clinton, he, he debunked it, he had own experts debunking it, and got hated on for this, oh, traitor and blah, blah, blah. And then many years later, what those of us who actually had the sense to keep some pure news sources knew all along, uh, became the unavoidable admission. But what I don't get is all these people who have news sources that are gaslighting them or telling them untruths, whether they are aware it's not true, doesn't matter. Because the one criteria you have to have regarding information sources is truthfulness. If not, why don't just tune into Lord of the Rings or, or, or Harry Potter or some fantasy, some fiction? What's the point of keeping track of social reality if you are not being fed the truth? That has to be your primary concern. And so when you are addicted to sources that time and time again are wrong on everything, you know, in the old days, that had a cost. That was costly for, for news outlets. That's why they, they, they couldn't afford it. Too embarrassing. Once, okay, maybe, but, but not twice. And also it depends on how big it is. If you, they were cheering on the Iraq war, that should be eternal disqualifier. Whether it's a pundit or a orga news organization or whatever it is. But that kind of accountability is gone. It's all about teams now sharing on, you know, my team versus your team. People want to be right. They don't want truth. And that is also then costly uh, for people like Jimmy. Just take the Syria thing. He was on the money. He gave uh, a platform to Aaron Maté, the award-winning journalist, award for exactly his Sy Syria coverage. Or was it his Russia get coverage? I can't remember anymore. But... Uh, this is uh, thanks to, to Dor, who gives a voice to the voiceless. So he was on the money for that. People hated on him for it. Oh, Assad, apologist, whatever. And then, bam, 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 every, everything is correct in the aftermath. Al-CIA, as I call them, and ISIS, how they were funded by the American intel agencies. Again, while it was going on, oh, outrageous conspiracy theory. Now... Matter of fact. <laughs> so it has happened again and again. COVID, of course, COVID. Oh, the cost of standing up to the COVID regime. Jimmy was critical to so many things, as you heard in the show today, uh, regarding how COVID was handled. Of course, got smeared and shadow banned left and right. Uh, condemned. And yeah, everything was correct. No kudos for that in the aftermath. No good deeds goes unpunished. And of course, uh, the latest uh, order of the day is the Ukraine war. And he, from the beginning, his very healthy political instincts uh, understood all about that. And, oh, you're a Putin apologist, whatever, just because you are nuanced and are exposing the military-industrial complex. But of course, uh, he was right about everything, as is becoming more and more evident. Um, as I say these words, I mean, the, the war, uh, Ukraine is about to collapse now. And everything Jimmy predicted, uh, and his guests, of course, has come true. I guess we could also add the Gaza thing. 
And like he says, if it wasn't anti-Semitic to do it to South Africa, it's not anti-Semitic to do it to Israel. And I'm assuming this quote is addressing the, the boycott or the criticism or calling it out for being apartheid. Um, a leading Zionist said that, was complaining that the support for Zionism and Israel's genocide of uh, Palestinians, who, by the way, are not just Muslims, they are also Christians and even Jews. Did you know there are Jewish Palestinians who refuse, who have ha, has the opportunity to become Israeli citizens, but who, who stay true to their Palestinian identification and are suppressed and genocided as much as Christian Palestinians and Muslim Palestinians and, and Christian churches like in, in um, Bethlehem being bombed, eradicated. Anyway, I, I'm getting away from my, the point. Point being that this Zionist complained that it's not a left-right issue, it's become a young-old issue. So the older someone is, the more they tend to sympathize with Israel, the apartheid regime. Whereas people of a certain age and, and down, I guess middle age and down, increasingly sympathize with the victims here, Palestinians. And of course, because... Uh, they have uh, access to independent media and know about the horrors going on there. So give it uh, five years, maybe not that much, and these enormous crimes going on in real time will become evident for everyone to see. But no, people have to condemn, uh, you know, being emotional in the moment, condemn and lash out, and then the pride stops them from settling the score when it's proved that they're wrong. And that's so alien to me. First of all, I try to live by a attitude where I do not... Like, like the stronger you opinionate about something, the goddamn surer you have to be. So why do you have to judge all the time? You don't. Suspend judgment until you are better informed. Especially contested cases, especially where you do not have good access to first-hand primary sources. But even if you're human and you are mistaken from time to time, like we all are, the least you need to do, not for anyone else, for yourself, for your own self-respect, for your own honor, is to come clean, admit it, and even apologize if you bother someone who were right when you were wrong. But, of course, nobody lives by these principles anymore. At least not in the modern Western world. So, yep, you're going to be hated on when you are right all the time. So I'm not saying, like, I'm not kissing his ass saying he's right all the time because I'm, I'm a fan of his. No, no. I support him because he has been right all the time. Of course, also because he's funny and he gives me... You know, I, I do watch non-comedy news show like I mentioned in the intro the Duran for example um, but I do also appreciate the light to take I mean it's just as serious it's just as good information but when Russell Brand and Jimmy Dore spices it up a little it makes some of the more depressing things easier to digest so yeah I, I don't mind the comedy approach some other things I want to add about Jimmy he was completely right when all the left were freaking out in 16 because Trump won. Jimmy made a point that uh, Clinton presidency would be worse for the left wing. I mean the real left. Jimmy represents what's left of the real left. Uh, then a uh, Trump presidency because he very correctly knew that people go to sleep when uh, Obama, Clinton... And people are, and, and Biden, when they take over, the left goes to sleep, remaining, you know, partisan loyal instead of protesting. Like, for example, uh, about the Assange case, which Jimmy has been on from day one, another of his his uh, correct stances. Uh, or remember, they were criticizing kids in cages on the border when it was on the Trump. Well, as soon as Biden took over, nobody cared. They were criticizing Trump for expelling people and uh, said nothing under Obama who expelled twice as many people from the country. So his point was it's better actually for, for the real left to have a Trump presidency because then they are not being put to sleep by the neolibs. 
And he was right about that. Just compare the Biden presidency to the Trump presidency. Another issue where, where Jimmy has been in the vanguard is the huge battle at the left regarding Medicare for all and forced the vote. Now, I don't know if my European audience may not be too interested in, in or up to date on, on the matters I'm discussing now, but Matt Gates, I think, is called on, on the populist right. He, he did a cleanup in the Congress where his wing managed to get tons of concessions. And thank God for that, because that's how we could have the hearings about COVID and about the censorship and the UFOs, etc. But in order to achieve that democratization and accountability in Congress, he did a strategy which has been named Force the Vote. And before he did that, Jimmy Dore and many others on the populist left wanted something similar to happen when Nancy Pelosi, the, the very corrupt Speaker of the House, were up for re-election. And many prominent voices on the left was a part of this uh, demand. For example, Justin Jackson of the LA Chargers, political commentators Crystal Ball and Brianna Joy Gray, and also independent president candidate Cornell West. But for some reason, all these haters of Dorr, and the, mind you, they're not on the right. It's the neolibs. They hate him because he calls the bluff all the time. He reveals their agenda and, you know, puts them to shame. So his biggest opponents are actually <laughs> what he himself calls shit lips. So they, who pretended to be for Medicare for All, said, no, 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 we cannot put the Medicare for All demand on Nancy Pelosi with forced, that's what forced the vote, was forcing a vote on Medicare for all. Because this, that, this, that, this, that, and all the this and that were, were bullshit. Everything was wrong. And a couple of years after, Matt Gates and the populist right implemented the exact same strategy and got tons of concessions for it. Proving that the strategy supported by Doors and others were right. Now, another criticism or smear, I should say, that Dor has been suffering from is, is the conspiracy theorist hallmark. But, you know, today, this day and age, nobody's taking that one seriously anymore. So there's no point, like, trying to <laughs> clear that up because it comes with the territory. Anyone who disagrees with authority on anything in any field will get that smear because that's what it's created for, right? It's to shut down any critical thought, any debate, and it's like a bully tactic. But I will say this about it, is that Jimmy Dore, as a matter of fact, states that, in defending his show, states that we actually debunk conspiracy theories. Like the one that says that Assad gassed his own people, or that Russia bombed their own pipeline, or that Trump was in cahoots with Putin. And that was the cause for the WikiLeaks thing, which of course we all know now was Seth Rich, which of course Dora has also been right about. But there's been praise too of him. Indeed, I will say that more people praises him than criticizes him. The, the lonely, bitter voices are always agenda infested. But uh, a, a 19 article in the Chicago Tribune observed that Dora's material critiqued Wall Street and military industrial complex, big pharma, political operatives, and mainstream media. And I mean, who's left? That's the entire <laughs> power base. So, uh, I mean, smearing is faring light. Not, not too long ago, you would risk your life going up against these forces. And to a certain extent, one still does. It, it depends on the area and seriousness. Another review uh, I would like to share is uh, comedian Reginald Hunter who said in 19 that the Jimmy Joshua ha has a familiar soothing American impishness and that Dorr made caustically smart observations of the American political left. And another newspaper described Dorr as possessing a potent political voice. Indeed, many people have wanted him to 
run for president. But uh, I guess he appreciates his life enough not to get dragged into that. And a remarkable thing about Jimmy is that half his audience is not leftists, but so-called right. Or maybe it's uh, more like his audience is divided into three. Those who associate with left, those who associate with right, and those who are independents. But I hope more and more people are aware that the left-right thing just doesn't apply in the current political climate. Still, those who, who come from the traditional right respect him because they immediately recognize that he's a truth speaker. And, uh, you know, you have to respect that wherever the, your source is. Because w when you have honest people, when you listen to honest people, it doesn't matter that much if you disagree with them on certain issues. What does it matter? What, what are you afraid? Or, or, or are your convictions so fragile that as soon as you hear another opinion, you agree with that? Well, okay, even if that's true, so what? Then uh, probably you were wrong. And if you are convinced you're right, it doesn't matter if your source has another opinion. At least you're getting the truth. That's what matters. And so they do tune into uh, the Jimmy Dore show, partly comic relief, but mostly, of course, to get some truth and uh, some truth to power notwithstanding. So, you know, almost every video of him, I see comments starting with, I do not always agree with Jimmy, but dot dot dot, or I'm a conservative who disagree with him on many things, but I have to say that dot 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 dot. And I think Jimmy even prides himself of attracting a heterogenic audience, being aware himself, of course, that um, they come from all stripes and colors. And that is indeed, I think, the proudest badge you could have. I think to a certain extent or a smaller extent, the same is true for, for my show, but my show isn't explicitly political anyway. So it's much easier to have a diverse audience. Plus, the diversity among you guys is also because you are attracted from different angles, from different types of series that we're holding. Since we're a variety show, not just focused on a particular subject type. But when you're a political comedy show like Jimmy's, then indeed it is, it is more of an achievement, I think. Kind of akin to how, for example, Tucker Carlson uh, attracts people from all over the scale. When he was still having his own show on Fox, he, it was actually the largest news show for Democrats. In other words, when they pulled uh, Democratic voters, voters of the Democratic Party, the number one show they were tuning into was uh, Tucker Carlson. Of course, he also had a traditional right and, of course, the populist right and the libertarians. So, and that, I think, is for the same reason. Uh, Carlson is a truth-sayer coming from the so-called other side. Both of them today realizing that they are at the side of the people against the growing global totalitarianism, the international security state, the Five Eyes Intel military complex. So... In closing, I remind you of his show. Uh, he's got one up in London, I think, in Copenhagen, and then Oslo 9th of April. You should check out his COVID Lies Are Funny, which is very cheap. You just go to jimmydorecomedy.com, jimmydorecomedy.com, where you also get the tickets, by the way, for his uh, tour. But there you can rent or buy the affordable price, his uh, stand-up comedy COVID lies are funny. You know, he has some legendary quotes. I'll just share a few with you. One is, I am not the sharpest knife in the knife, <laughs> in the knife thing. Uh, and I would be a vegetarian <laughs> if the food, <laughs> if the food was better. <laughs> so excuse me, if the food was better. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's funny because it's true. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, as you understand, I will have a good time 
watching Jimmy on Tuesday 9th of April in Oslo. I hope to see you there. That's it. Thanks for listening. As always, I've been your host, Al. Thanks to my team. Thanks to your support. And remember to subscribe whatever outlet, whatever platform you listen to us. I'll leave you with this final Jimmy quote. Comedy should speak truth to power. It should always be aimed upward. When it's aimed downward, it's called bullying. Be seeing you. Number one.